Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we are going to continue our series entitled The Price of Doing and the Cost of Ignoring. And this message, part two, is entitled Commendation or Judgment. In our first message, we left off on verse 14, where the citizens hated the nobleman and did not want him to reign over them. And we're going to pick up this message in verse 15. But first, let us read the scripture again, just to refresh our memories. Luke chapter 19, verse 11 through 27. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. You know that most. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with your own word, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the miner from him and give it to the one who has the ten miners. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten miners. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But for those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. In part one, we covered verses 11 through 14. A nobleman, representing Jesus, plans to go into a far country to receive his kingdom and then return. The return is the blessed hope of the church, also known as the return of Jesus Christ. He called ten of his servants representing the church or the body of Christ and gave them work to do, which represents the Great Commission, telling the good news of the gospel of Jesus, and then the nobleman left, which represents the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Verse 14 represents the rejection of Jesus by the world. We showed evidence of the world's rejection of Jesus, and basically they're saying the same thing that these citizens in the parable was saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Verse 11 through 14 is all about the first coming of Jesus and his ascension 2,000 years ago and what he expects the church to be doing while he is gone. Verse 15 now describes the return of the nobleman and what he expects to find at, when, when he returns. And if he does not find what it is that he's looking or he's expecting to find, then there are going to be consequences. So that's where we're going to pick it up this morning in verse 15. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had, been, he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. 
As the church, we believe that there will be what we refer to as the rapture. When Paul, when what happens, what, what Paul described in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 18 says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That would be those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior and who had been obedient to the call, the work that had been given to them. The rest of the verse says, and we who remain, meaning the Christians who have not yet died, those of us who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior and who, who are now doing his will, doing what it is he has called us to do, will be caught up with those who have died to meet Jesus in the air. That is what the early church called the blessed hope. And that is very, very exciting. Paul even told the Thessalonian church, he said, hey guys, use this good news this, this good news of Jesus is coming back to get us and we'll be with him forever. Use that to encourage one another because it's the greatest news ever. So I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back for us and he's not too far off. He's already on his way back. So make sure that you're doing what it is that you should be doing, what he has called you to do. We will have to give an account to him for what we did not do and for what we have done. And when he comes back and if we're, we have nothing to show for the minor he has given us, we're going to be in big trouble. Therefore, it is imperative. I can't stress it enough. We have to work hard while there is time I'm telling you, Jesus is on his way back. Everything in the world is shaping up for these last days. Now, just as a refresher, I want to remind you that a mina was money back in those days. And it represents our gifting. It represents what Jesus has called us to do, our calling. So it, it, it represents what Jesus wants us to complete or accomplish or to invest in the kingdom while he is gone. And now that we've covered that, let us push on to verse 16 through 19. Starting at verse 16. The first came before him saying, Lord, your miner has made ten miners more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little. You shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your miner has made five miners. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Every one of his servants were called, and those who produced those who used their gifts, whether they were spiritual gifts, physical gifts, or financial gifts, were all given commendations. They were all given rewards. And, and they, they received their, their rewards for their hard work. The problem is that some Christians do not want to work hard. They do not want to pay the price of doing when persecution breaks out, they try to avoid it. They take the, their hand from the plow. And the scripture tells us that we're not worthy of Jesus if we put our hand to the plow and then look back. We're not worthy of him. Others try to fit in. They try to 
be one with the world. They yield to political correctness. And the problem is with political correctness is that it pleases the world, but it offends God because it keeps your minor in your handkerchief. And still others are satisfied to just skate into heaven without anyone ever knowing that they were even Christians at all. They just want enough of Jesus to feel comfortable. It's all about feeling comfortable. The problem is with feeling comfortable is that we'll be like the proverbial frog in the hot water who was boiled to death. This type of thinking will get you boiled to eternal death in a lake of fire. So we have to be, 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 be wary of comfortableness. When we get too comfortable, we start to slip. We, we stop witnessing. We just want to make it through. So we, we don't want to be comfortable. Why? Because it keeps your mind in a handkerchief and hidden in the ground. We are all given gifts, all sorts of gifts to build up to strengthen, to encourage. We are to use our gifts for, for the good of the body of Christ. Look at what Paul said when he described the gifts in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 through 8. This is Paul describing the gifts that, that, that is given to each one. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. This means that whether you receive one minor or you receive ten minors, you are to use it because you have been given it according to your faith. So you have to use whatever is given to you to complete the job that Jesus has given you to complete. More will not be expected of you than your measure of faith, but less will not be acceptable either. You have to use it according to your faith that was given to you. The next five verses in, in, in Romans chapter 12, will describe the different gifts. Verse four. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our servant. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Each gift differs from the other so that the whole body of Christ might be built up, the whole body of Christ might be encouraged, that the whole body of Christ might grow, might expand. If you have a spiritual gift of hospitality, you should be entertaining people, especially the body of Christ. Or if you have the gift of teaching, you cannot be intimidated not to teach. Or if you're called to preach, you cannot be like Jonah and run from the call. You have to be do what you are called to do. Even those who have been given money, you don't and, and you don't pay tithe or, or give back the tithe, and you don't give contributions, you don't give offerings, and you don't help those who are less fortunate, those who are in need. And whenever you have the opportunity to minister um, to them financially and, and you pass it over, you refuse to do it. You will be held accountable to Jesus when he returns. He will be saying, what did you do with my minor? Because that minor, that, 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 those finances, it is not yours. It is his. All that money that you have stored up in the bank, that your bank account is swelling every day, every day. 
I have a road awaiting it for you. It is not your money that you have stored away in the bank. It belongs to Jesus. He has given it to you and he expects a return on his money that he has given to you when he returns. Jesus is going to ask you, what did you do with the gift that I have given you? And if there's no answer, he will pronounce judgment right then and right there. You know, a Christian friend of mine once told me that he had never, ever won one soul to the Lord in all his years of being a Christian. The problem is that a lot of Christians are like that. They've never won a soul to the Lord. And it's because they have never witnessed. They have never shared the good news. If you're a Christian, please know this. You are held accountable for the mina that you are given. I want us to refresh our memories on Luke chapter 19, verse 20 through 26. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You know that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten miners. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The servant said that he was afraid. And Jesus continuously encouraged his disciples not to be afraid. He said, fear not, fear not, fear not. The scriptures continuously encourages us, even commands us not to be afraid, but be courageous be courageous. The biggest reason for not evangelizing is fear. Fear of offending the party you're wanting to witness to. Fear of offending third party listeners who might overhear your conversation. Fear of offending your employer. Fear of breaking some political correct rule about religion in the workplace. Fears within, fears without. Fear is not an excuse to disobey God. Fear is a hindrance to the kingdom, is a hindrance to the furtherance of the kingdom, to the growing of the kingdom, is a hindrance to women's souls. This is what Peter and John said when they were brought before their rulers and elders and scribes along with Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family when they were brought before them in Acts chapter 4 verse 19 through 20. This is what Peter and John answered. It says, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Peter and John were saying, you are all smart men. You guys, you all know the scriptures, you're versed. In the scriptures. So you tell us, you tell us now, whether or not it is in our best interest not to talk about Jesus because you think it's politically incorrect. Well, for us, we can't help but speak. We can't stop talking about life. We cannot hold it in. This is what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 20, chapter 9, chapter 20, verse 9. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. We who are given the responsibility with the words of life, we cannot help but to speak the name of Jesus, which sets captives free. We cannot shut it up. This, this word that we have heals the sick. It bridges the gap. It restores the breach. It restores relationships. It repairs the breach and saves the soul from eternal flames, from the fires of, uh, of hell. If you love Jesus, 
if you understand eternity, if you believe that a lake of fire, burning fire awaits each and every one who rejects salvation, who have turned their back on Jesus, who have disobeyed and just not done what Jesus has called them to do, then you will not be silent. Indeed, you cannot keep silent. You are bound by love. You are bound by compassion, forced, as it were, to share the good news of Jesus, to tell them what he has done for you and what he can do for them. The bottom line is this. You cannot fear man who can only kill the body, but rather fear God who after killing the body has the power to cast your soul into the eternal flames of the lake of fire that burns forever and ever and ever. That is who you should fear. That is whom you should obey. Do not let political correctness keep you silent and rob you of your reward. Do not let political correctness steal your commendations. There are, there, there are definite rewards for obeying. There, there are rewards for doing, but there are also consequences for disobeying. There are consequences for not doing. So tell me, which would you prefer? The joy of rewards and commendations or the re regret of consequences and judgment. You need to decide and you need to decide today because we're living in the end times. The world is shaping up for this one world government. We're going to go over this in another, in another message, but just, just a, a few weeks ago, a few days ago, they, um, the world summit met the World Government Summit 2022, they met. And Klaus Schwab said that there's big changes coming in the food chain, the supply chain, and they, they don't even know all the ramifications that's going to happen. But we're gonna cover that in another message. What I'm telling you, my friends, is that we are living in the last days. These days on, are, are coming to a, a, a short, short end, this side of, of eternity. We gotta prepare. We gotta get our loved ones prepared. We gotta get our friends or coworkers. We, we cannot let political correctness keep our mind up in our handkerchiefs. We don't have a lot of time left. We're gonna pick it up right there. We're gonna finish off this message discussing this last servant who just wanted to make it in, who, who kept his, his mind in his handkerchief in our, next, in our message next week. But in closing, what I want to do, I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Has Jesus given you a minor and you has, you've kept it hidden in a handkerchief? I'm telling you, if you've done that, Jesus is not going to be pleased when he comes back. Here's what I would like for you to do. Everyone who has their mind hidden in a handkerchief, I want you to pray this prayer. Everyone who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer. It's just a simple prayer, a prayer of forgiveness. Pray this prayer with me. If you want to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you want to have forgiveness in your life, that when Jesus comes back, you'll be ready to meet him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, I accept the free gift of salvation. I believe that you died on the tree for me. I believe that you were sacrificed on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were dead and buried. I believe on the third day you rose again. I believe that you ascended into heaven. And I believe that you're coming back real soon. 
I accept that free gift. And I believe in you. Help me now to live. Help for you. Help me to use that minor that you have given me to produce in the kingdom. That when you come back, you'll be pleased with me. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible, read your Bible, learn the Bible, commit the verses to memory. Find a church, a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches, but a Bible-believing church that still believes there's a right way and a wrong way to live. One of those churches that's not a friend to the world, does not promote the things of the world, who is not politically correct. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. It's not going to be an easy road. I'm not promising you an easy road, but the reward will be great. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.